my name is Wei Lin and welcome back to my channel. I'm a flutist, performer, and music teacher located in the city of Kamloops, British Columbia, and this is my channel where we do all things flute. So thank you so much for joining me here today. And in today's video, we're going to be introducing high C sharp and D. So if you're interested, then just keep on watching. As always, if you have any questions about the video, please feel free to drop them in the comment section down below. I do my best to answer them as soon as I see them. And also, please check out my free practice guide, also located in the description down below. It gives you eight really easy steps to follow to help guide your practice sessions. All right, so let's just get right into today's video. Of course, we're gonna be reading it from our favorite book here, the Trevor Wise Beginner's Book for the Flute, part two. And we're going to be working just primarily on page 74 here. So we're going to start by putting the fingerings for high C sharp and D. So I'm going to put it up right over here. If you're going to notice that C is pretty much the exact same fingering as the C just below it. So you're just going to be putting that right hand pinky down. So that's going to be that C. So of course, if you want, you can use um, going down to that lower octave there and then using some air and pushing your mouth forward to get that higher octave. So this is what the higher C sharp sounds like. Very good. I would use lots of harmonics. Of course, if you don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to harmonics, I do have a video where I talk all about tone and I go into depth about harmonics. I'm just gonna put it up in the little I card there for you if you're interested in looking a little bit more into harmonics. But definitely make sure that you are very aware of your tuning when it comes to that high C sharp because it can sit very, very sharp in the register. So you wanna be able to practice it by training your ear to make sure you got the correct pitch of that C sharp. You can always alternatively play that with a piano and match the same piano key there with the flutes so that you can really match up what those two C sharps sound like. And then the fingering for the high D, it's pretty much like you're playing a normal G and all you're gonna be doing is lifting up your first finger on your left hand. So that means you're gonna be playing two, three, thumb on the back and your right hand pinky. And this is what the D sounds like. Good. So of course, all of my tips when it comes to the high register is gonna come into play here. So you're always gonna make sure that when you are introducing yourself to these notes, that you look at these three different things in your playing to see if there are any things that you need to change or experiment with in order to get those higher notes because they're definitely that next level up when it comes to playing on the flute. So number one, of course, you're always gonna be starting with your breath support. So it's very important that you have really good breath support when it comes to playing these high notes. Otherwise, if you don't have enough air, it won't come out at all, or it'll actually drop to the octave below. And you'll find that you'll have a lot of inconsistencies with getting up to those higher notes. So make sure that you always take a really nice deep breath, just like you're yawning, really fill up your tummy, and if you can, you can actually start expanding your lungs out so you kind of feel like your rib cage expands, just like singers do. And that way you have enough air in your body that you can actually put it into the instrument when you're playing those higher notes. And with this in particular, you also want to pay attention to your air speed. So as you get into the higher register, the air speed definitely does get faster, but you don't want it to get super fast or you don't want it to be sounding super shrill. So make sure that you do have a controlled embouchure, but try and keep space in your mouth essentially to kind of give it a bit of resonance. So what I like to think about is I like to think about having the back of my tongue down, almost like your Darth Vader, like, like when you, when you try imitating Darth Vader, that's the kind of space you want to try and achieve when you're playing those high notes because it can be really easy to just kind of clamp everything down, make everything really tight, and just kind of squeeze the air through the embouchure hole to get those high notes. But in the long run, that's really not going to help at all. It's just going to make your sound really, really tense and shrill. So make sure that everything is nice and open as you can and just really go in there with a lot of air and faster air speed. Number two, of course, you're gonna always wanna take a look at your embouchure here. So when we are in the higher register, your embouchure hole is not going to be a little bit more pursed forward, a little bit perhaps smaller, but not very much so, because you definitely need to get that air to come out, of course, that you need the high, lots of air and the air speed, right? So you definitely need to have a good uh, embouchure hole there, 
but it should be nice and focused rather than it being wider like it is in the lower register. And of course, number three, looking at your finger technique. So make sure that you do have a lot of support with your left hand here because you don't want to be putting a ton of pressure holding down that c-sharp it just should just be nice, like sitting there really nice and gentle so you're not really putting any pressure at all and that should really help to get any of that tension out and of course this is going to be very difficult at the beginning when you're first getting into that high register so what i recommend is just using a ha articulation so don't do any tongue because it's easy to just go and try to get out that high note so I would recommend using just ha and try to do shorter notes, kind of like this. And once you can start doing that more consistently, then try extending those notes a little bit. So rather than just being a, a nice short note, try and give it an extra beat. So for example, be a way to familiarize yourself with playing in the high register along with of course practicing your enharmonics there. All right but now that we've introduced the high notes here we're going to play some exercises. So I'm going to put up exercise number one right over here. So this one we're just going to quickly go over some of the starter bits and then we will get into playing it. So I'm not going to clap and count it just because it is quarter notes and then a dotted half note at the end there. So of course, you're gonna look at your key signature first. So we have three accidentals, which means that we're in A major. So just make sure that you're playing F sharps, C sharps, and G sharps. And then we are in four, four, so four quarter notes per measure, of course. Three, there's no tempo indication because you really just want to make sure that you're playing as an exercise, getting used to playing those high notes. So don't worry about playing it too fast or too slow, just whatever works best for you. Number four, articulation. So we don't have anything written, so just a nice, again, rather than using too much tongue at the beginning, just try this exercise with hot articulation. And then once you feel like you have that more consistently, then again, add your regular tonguing back to, to make the beginning of the note a little bit more clear. Five, of course, we're gonna be looking at dynamics. We don't have any dynamics here. So again, you really wanna focus on getting used to playing in that register. So you're gonna be playing forte or double forte and that's totally okay. And then six roadmap, nothing, just top to bottom there. Okay, so now we're gonna play it. Again, I'm not even gonna use a metronome here. I'm just gonna play it so that you have an idea of what it should sound like, generally speaking. So I'm gonna go at one, Two, three. Very good. So again, really make sure you're focusing on those three things that I spoke about earlier when I was talking about playing in those the high notes there and again if you are having issues with the air and if you want you can also slur all of those notes as well just to see how things are changing when you're playing a note your a note to b up to that c sharp and then coming down again that might be really great for figuring out what little things are changing in your breath your embouchure and your fingers as well so another way you could play this like i just mentioned is with slurs that would look like this That's again really going to make you focus on your breath and your air speed specifically. And then once you're comfortable with that, try the huzz. And then once you're comfortable with that, add in the tiny and see how that goes. And then of course, if you want, you can also do the harmonics here. If you don't have the low B keys, that's totally okay. You can just finger the low D for the A. And then of course, your low C sharp for the high C sharp. So it would sound a little bit like this. you to get 
the feeling of openness when you then play that again with the regular fingering. All right, and then we're also gonna look at exercise number three. So I'm just gonna put that up here really quickly. I'm not gonna go through any of the starter bits here, just because we're just essentially playing Ds and Cs in their octaves. So I guess this is a great exercise to use your end harmonics with. So fingering the low D right there just to get both of those octaves. Try and do that with the anharmonics with the C sharp there. Back to D. And then once you're comfortable with that, you can also try slurring the anharmonics together as well. And then once you're comfortable with that, then add the fingering. Very nice. All right, so now that we've gotten a little practice with playing those higher notes, and we're gonna add it into an exercise. So I'm gonna put up the scale exercise in D major right over here. So this one, again, we'll just quickly go through the first six starter bits. Actually, we're gonna skip the clapping count again here today. If you're not confident with the rhythm, always go and use your metronome, clap it out, count it out to make sure that you have it right. But they're just straight eighth notes all the way through with the last note just being the whole note there. So I'm gonna leave that up to you to make sure that you are playing that correctly. And of course, we're definitely gonna use the metronome here when we're playing it with the flute to make sure that we are nice and consistent and we don't have some notes that are too fast or some notes that are too slow, you wanna get them just right. So one, we're gonna be looking at our key signature here. So we have two sharps, which means that of course we know we're in D major, so F sharp and C sharp. Two, we're looking at our time signature, four over four, four chord notes per measure. And again, we are just reading those with lots of eighth notes there, so make sure you got that. Tempo indication, I'm gonna be doing this at a quarter note equals 104. Of course, when you're practicing it for the first time, make sure it is nice and slow. If you're using this to help you when you're practicing with the flute, make sure that you definitely go back into the playback settings, so way down to a tempo that really works for you when you're not playing with any mistakes or anything like that and then speed it up once you are comfortable very slowly with a metronome to get it up to the tempo that you want to perform it at. And then number four, articulation. So here we have groups of, essentially the whole bar is gonna be underneath the slur. So it's gonna be a total of eight notes under each slur. It does change in the fourth bar because we do have a quarter note there, but otherwise we have that. And then in the fifth bar it changes again. We have the slurs of four notes and four notes there. So four slurred, four slurred, four slurred, four slurred, four slurred, four slurred until the end. There aren't any dynamics here, so we definitely wanna make sure that you're playing it at a really nice, beautiful sound. Again, mezzo forte, forte. If you're wanting to get louder when it's in the high register, it's totally okay. Just make sure you're checking your pitch there. And then of course we don't have any repeats or anything in this one, so just top to the bottom. Make sure that you do clap and count this in case you are finding that your rhythm isn't quite coming out correctly. You can always check that by recording yourself either on your phone or having somebody listen to you because sometimes it's, you might think that you're playing with the metronome perfectly on time, but that isn't always true. So make sure that sometimes if you need that extra ear, ask a friend or a family member to come and just see if you're lining up those eighth notes correctly or if not, you can always record yourself and then uh, listen to yourself as if you're listening to a friend and see how the recording matches up to what you feel like you're actually playing. Or I'm gonna do it at a quarter note equals 104. And make sure that you do, again, cross-reference any of those fingerings there if you're not sure before playing it and also writing in any notes there in case you need them. One, two, three, and... to the low C sharp all the way up to that high D. So again, definitely take it really nice and slow. And if you want, really break it down from one note to one note and then adding one note beside each other so you're just playing a group of two notes 
until you feel very comfortable with it. And again, really making sure that your finger technique is really nice and close to the keys. You don't want to have wild flaying fingers here. And also thinking about making sure that your flute is nice and balanced so you're primarily keeping the weight in your left hand so that your fingers have all the freedom that they need to play those notes uh, without being encumbered or anything like that. All right, now we're going to go to our piece for today and that is going to be the Sicilian and I'm just gonna put that one right over here. So this one, we're gonna go into deeper depths when it comes to the starter bits, because there are lots of things going on, and then we'll go into clapping and counting and then playing the piece. So number one, we're gonna be looking at our key signature. So here we have two sharps, so F sharp and C sharp. So again, we can either be in the major key, D major, or it's relative minor, B minor. So look at the first note and the last note to see if we have that tonic. And we do have D as the first and D as the last. So that would highly suggest we're in D major. We'll look and see if we can find any indication of the, the minor key here. So B is the minor key, so B minor. Again, you can go down three letter names to find that. And we'll see if we can find the raised seventh or raised sixth. So that would be A sharp or G sharp. And at a quick glance, we do have a G sharp and the second line last bar there. But otherwise, there aren't really any indications that we are playing in the minor key. We might have a hint here or there, but otherwise we're playing a D major. Two, we're going to be looking at our time signature here. So here we have a really interesting time signature. So we are playing 12 over 8. So the top number tells us that we have 12 beats per measure. And each of those beats are going to be eighth notes. So that means we have 12 eighth notes per measure. And how this is divided is really interesting. So how we count this time signature is that we have four groups of three eighth notes. So you have one, two, three, then four by six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10, 11, 12. So that's how it works. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's how you're going to feel this piece. It's going to be really interesting to count. And we'll look at the tempo here, at least it's a large ghetto. So that means that we're playing really slow and we're going to be counting each eighth note. So if you feel like you can't really get a hold of that, that's totally okay. Just know that the big beats are going to be every group of three eighth notes. And this is going to be a great exercise for those who uh, are coming from our previous lesson, compound times, because this is another compound time. Number three, we're gonna be looking at our tempo indications. So as I mentioned, we're in our ghetto. So that means pretty, almost very slow. And then this is gonna mean eighth note equals 112. So of course I'm gonna clap and count it and I'm gonna play it at that tempo. If it's too fast, you can always slow it down even more. But if you want to, if you do wanna play it a little bit faster, no need, cause that is the final tempo. Four, we're gonna be looking at our dynamics. So here we start on the piano, then we have a nice crescendo into that second bar. After that high D, then we have a D crescendo. And then we have nothing else written up until that third bar. We have a decrescendo over the, or underneath the G and F sharp. And then we have nothing else written until the second line, second bar. We have a nice beautiful crescendo to that B as, or the A and B there at the last bar. And then decrescendo again. And then looking at the third line and we start on a piano sonata, which is very soft. We have a crescendo there into the second bar where we come down again and to piano. And then we have another crescendo and another decrescendo down to piano sonata again. And then a crescendo and another decrescendo until the end. So we have lots of hairpin dynamics here. So that means crescendo, decrescendo, crescendo, decrescendo. So we have lots of really interesting things going on. And in this piece, you definitely want to make sure you're paying attention to the dynamics because it is going to be at a slower tempo. So it'll really help to give the, the piece its character and its life. And then five, we're going to be looking at our articulation. So generally here we have slurs over every group of those basic three eighth notes. So here we have a lot of the rhythm, which is the dotted eighth and sixteenth. So one, two, and three. One, two, and three. And we'll get into that when we clap and count it. But generally whenever you see that little rhythmic motif, all of those ones are going to be slurred. Otherwise, we don't have really too many other articulations there. Just make sure that you do have the slurs when they're not just on that little motif. So for example, I'm looking at one, two, yeah, bar three of the piece where we have, when we're doing crescendo, we have that G to the F sharp. Make sure that you do slur that and that comes up a few other times as well. So it's the quarter with the eighth note there. We have the slur, generally speaking. And then make sure that you're also taking note where we do have ties as well. So I'm looking, at, especially at the first bar, 
and I'm looking at that A there. So we have a dotted quarter tied to another quarter. So that one, we're actually going to be playing five beats together. So not so just as if they were one big note. So that's generally how they write it, just because it's easier to count it when we're reading it in compound times. And then number six, we're going to be looking at our roadmap here. So we definitely do have some repeats, so make sure that you take note. So we're going to notice that we have two dots there at the beginning of the piece, right after the time signature. So that indicates the beginning of a repeat. And the end of that repeat is at the second line, last bar. So when you're playing it, you're going to play through that once, and then you're going to go back to the beginning and play through it again. And then after that, you're just going to play it all the way through like normal, where we do have a rallentando on that last bar with a nice fermata on the last notes there. All right, so now we're going to get into clapping and counting this piece. So again, an eighth note is going to equal 112. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, and 3. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, and three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, and three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, and three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 12. <laughs> Just getting a little tired there. So if you find that counting it like that is a little bit tricky, I do too. Definitely started this a few times over. What I like to do when I'm playing this, I like to just count one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Or you can also do it like one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. So that means you're really just counting the big beats of each of the bars just to kind of help you uncomplicate things as much as possible. So again, you can count it like I was just doing. So all the beats having a separate number, you can also do it in just groups of three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Or you can also do it when you're emphasizing the large beats. So one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. Okay, so now we're going to play it with the flute again, making sure that you check all of your notes first. So go into the fingering chart that I have every single one of my videos and just cross reference to make sure you have the correct fingering before you play the piece. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven.
So of course, I would say the hardest part of playing this piece would definitely be getting all those dynamics in there. So really making sure that you have all of them in there. If you, again, I ended up playing a little bit louder than a piano, so about a mezzo piano up to mezzo forte. And that was just to make sure that I got all the intonation there correctly. So feel free to bring it up in volume and just try and do your best to give as much dynamic contrast there as possible and really pay attention to any of those ties. So I found that when I was playing it, some ties that I really wanted to make sure that you take note of would be in the fourth line, second bar, that D and beats 9, 10, 11. So make sure that you really get those ones there. And then the same thing in the second to last bar there, that one can be really tricky. So that's gonna be it for today's video. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section down below. And also, please feel free to check out my free practice guide. If you like this video, please make sure you press the like button and also to press subscribe for videos just like this. I wanna say thank you so much for joining me here today. And you are amazing and I really appreciate you spending your time with me. And as always, happy blooming.